This is an ABC podcast. Hello, I'm Paul Barclay. I think it's safe to say that most of you these days don't smoke. In fact, if you're listening to this Big Ideas in America, Australia or Western Europe, chances are you know very few people who do smoke. But that situation's very different if you're listening to us in Eastern Europe or Korea, or if you're disadvantaged. That's what the stats say. Smoking rates among the poor and in certain parts of the world are still too high, despite decades of public health campaigns. Tobacco dependence remains the world's leading cause of preventable illness, and it's predicted to claim one billion lives this century. Public education, higher taxes, plain packaging, it's all helped to de-glamorise smoking. But today, big tobacco is reinventing itself as a harm reduction industry for smokers. Howard Coe from Harvard University explores future regulatory strategies. I'm presenting this topic for a number of reasons. First, it's affected millions and billions of lives, not just those directly affected, but family members too. For example, if you wish to raise your hand, I'm just kind of curious, how many of you here have had a friend or loved one or relative suffer from tobacco dependence? Okay, so this is not surprising. You know, about a third of you, about a half of you raised your hand. This is the situation we face globally, year in, year out, for far too long. And so um, if you take a historical point of view, this, this is a terrible, terrible part of our human history that we need to address. And then on a very personal note, I trained in multiple fields and started my career as a clinical oncologist determined to cure everybody of cancer that I met as a practicing physician. And on one hand, that was very rewarding to offer care to individual patients. But very early on, I saw too many of my patients suffering preventable suffering and dying preventable death due to tobacco addiction and dependence. And quite honestly, it was that type of experience that started my public health journey. When I saw patient after patient who was suffering and dying from tobacco dependence, and now later on I can understand it's from many other preventable causes as well, including COVID, I started asking myself, isn't there a broader, more inclusive, and perhaps even more impactful way of keeping people as healthy as possible? So what I'm going to do tonight is address this forever pandemic, take a very broad global view, focus particularly on the, on the United States, but this is going to be very global. So let's begin a saying from the WHO that's about 75 years old, is engraved in seven languages in the concrete of the exterior of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. If you come to Boston and visit our school, this WHO saying is engraved, literally engraved in the concrete of our building. Quote, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. And I love that quote. I love that phrase, the highest attainable standard of health. And to me, that means that your good health is a gift. And if you reach your highest attainable standard of health, that's public health success. That's fantastic. So let me just stop here and ask you, are you living your highest attainable standard of health? If you are, congratulations. You're a public health success. But if you're not, the next question is, why not? What can you do about it? What can we do about it? What can we do as a human global community together? That's basically what public health is all about. So I first started thinking about this when, again, I started my career as a young oncologist taking care of my cancer patients, and I saw very early on too many dying of tobacco-related cancers. So back in my training, I started looking at what are the leading causes of cancer death in women. So we have many very important causes of cancer death in women. And the good news is that for many of these, the, the trends are going the right way over time. And so we see breast cancer and those, those death rates are going down. Colorectal cancer, uterine cancer, stomach cancer, pancreatic's going up, unfortunately. But what's very disturbing 
is the line for lung cancer. The best cancer tracking systems in the U.S. started tracking data from about 1930 on. It tells you a very important snapshot about the history of cancer and therefore tobacco in the U.S. If you look at the history, cigarettes were invented in the late 1800s, around 1900 or so. People started using it in our country and around the world. And with use, all of a sudden you started seeing the rise of this cancer, which was initially pretty uncommon, then started rising and rising. I'll never forget in, the, in around 1990 when it passed breast cancer as leading cause of cancer death in women. That was a big headline, and I was still in training then. Uh, all of you know that breast cancer is a cancer that's feared by women. To have lung cancer surpass it, it is, it is very, very striking. And then what about for men? Again, there are very important trends in terms of key cancers in men, prostate, colorectal, others, but lung cancer. And the same trends, again, it starts very low level and then hits this peak. And now the only good thing is it's starting to go down as for men and women. And how do you explain it? Well, as you probably all remember, the, the key historic Surgeon General's report linking tobacco to terrible human outcomes, particularly cancer, was, was announced in 1964. And then from, it took about, so the scientific news was released around then, and then it took about 20 years for the impact of public health uh, interventions to, to straight, start taking effect. There have also been, of course, excellent progress in treatment of lung cancer, targeted therapies and immunotherapies, and also surgical advances as well. You add it all up, and the good news is that the lung cancer death rates are going down. But even as of right now, the leading cause of cancer death in the United States in men is lung. The leading cause of cancer death in women is lung. And close to 90% of this is preventable because it is due to tobacco dependence. So if you take a big step back, in the 20th century, some 100 million people died from tobacco dependence, most of them in high-income countries. And the projections are for the 21st century, that number will be more like a billion. Disproportionately hit low and middle income countries. So when you start looking at figures like this, you, you say to yourself, okay, if we're serious about prevention and public health, this is the issue we have to tackle and we have to tackle it together. So this started my, my journey in this whole area because the first effort, the 1992 Massachusetts Tobacco Tax Initiative, is one that changed my life. At the time, I was a volunteer for the American Cancer Society. I had completed my training. I was working at a Boston Medical Center seeing patients. And the state chapter of the American Cancer Society decided to have a campaign to try to convince Massachusetts voters to go to the poll in a ballot initiative and vote in support of a 25 cent tax increase per pack of cigarettes. And the rationale was if you increase the price, consumption drops. That's been very well studied by health economists and also generates potentially millions of dollars that could be used for public health and tobacco control. So I joined this volunteer effort back then, and it was, in hindsight, the most astonishing political experience that a young doctor like me could have. We did outreach. We did press. We were outspent by the tobacco industry 10 to 1. They formed an opposition committee called the Committee Against Unfair Taxation, completely funded by the tobacco industry. So it was, a, it was a pitched battle down to the end. The bumper sticker that was created for that, which is vote yes on question one, tax tobacco protect kids. And I'll never forget being in the strategy meetings where some of our political advisors said the tobacco industry is most, some of the most despised businesses in our state and our country, but protecting kids is something that everybody wants to do. So let's put it together in a bumper sticker so that people understand what we're trying to do. No one likes to talk about tax increases, but in this case, if you generate millions of dollars for public health and tobacco control and you protect kids, it might be worth it. So what I just described to you in a minute or two was a year and a half of a campaign. We were successful. We were joyous. But then a lot of that money coming in started being diverted away for other purposes. So I got even more involved after the initiative was successful, became chairman of that coalition, in fact. And then over time, we're spending more time at the state house begging our budget leaders not to divert the money away, but keep the money for tobacco control the way the voters wanted. 
And then the next thing I knew, the governor of Massachusetts noticed me and appointed me commissioner of public health and, and changed my life. <laughs> so, so one day I was involved in this advocacy and seeing patients. The next day I was the commissioner for a state health department of some 3,000 3, people, four hospitals, a $700 million budget, and just a little bit of politics. So that was a, a big transition for me. We did have, at the time, one of the most vibrant anti-tobacco programs in the country with media and outreach and education and counter-advertising. And our decline in cigarette consumption in Massachusetts was uh, greater than what we saw nationwide. So that, that was something very striking. And in fact, that whole effort was so transformative for me personally that I ended up writing it up in this article that came out in the journal Tobacco Control, Analysis of the Successful 1992 Massachusetts Tobacco Tax Initiative. And that sort of started my journey on policy now. 30 years ago, I cannot believe it. 1998 was also a huge historic landmark for the world because at that time, all the US attorneys general sued the tobacco industry to recoup Medicaid costs due to tobacco related illness and they settled the master settlement agreement where the tobacco industry was required to pay over $200 billion over 25 years. So huge step forward. And if I can say that whole initiative was led by Mississippi Attorney General Michael Moore, who has since become a very good friend. One of the outcomes of that settlement was to set up a national foundation for prevention of tobacco use and uh, now called the Truth Initiative. And I have the great honor of serving on that board with, with Mike Moore as, as the chair. By the way, if you want a real hero in public health law, Mike has gone on to help sue the opioid industry lately. And you're hearing a lot about that with Purdue Pharma in the news so where are we right now with the tobacco pandemic? You can look at graph after graph and make some big picture comments. But right now we can say that over 1 billion people smoke some form of tobacco uh, around the world with smoking rates much higher in men on average than women, over 30% for men, about 7% for women. Uh, in the U.S., it's, it's lower than the Global average, as you can see here, about 12, 13 percent. The differential between men and women is not so big in the U.S. We can glance and see there are hot spots in, in Europe and in, um, in Southeast Asia. And then if you look at maps for the death rate from smoking in 2019, about 15 to 20 percent of all global deaths are due to smoking or tobacco. A huge problem in Eastern Europe and in Asia and in Russia. So when you stop and think about it, this has been the topic of a lot of research, decades of research by tobacco industry scientists to make this a very efficient nicotine delivery device. And I just want to stress the terminology, which is going to be very important to this talk. It is a combustible nicotine delivery device. That means you light it on fire. And when you do, you burn the tobacco and it releases all these chemicals, dozens of carcinogens, about 60 by last count. And by the way, this is not an accident because this delivery device is being tweaked and modified all the time. There are filters in there to ease the, the smoke going into your lungs and make it more tolerable. There are flavors in there to make it a more pleasant user experience, including menthol bronchodilators to make this easier to go into your, your lungs. And then, of course, very importantly, nicotine, the key part of all this, which is addictive. And the big question is, uh, how do we handle the nicotine challenge in combustible nicotine delivery devices and then non-combustible ones like e-cigarettes, which I'll be talking about in a couple of minutes? So a big question here is, if we know how deadly this is, if we know how addictive this is, if we know how this has devastated lives for over a century, how does this keep getting sold from a business point of view? So there are many ways to answer that. But one major strategy here, which you cannot underestimate, is the power of advertising. And I've heard a number of fascinating presentations about advertising. We've all seen these ads. Don't think about it very much. There are thousands, millions of them that you can explore and study and discuss. And the advertising is either overt or covert. It's explicit or implicit. There's always a message being sent, whether you realize it or not. 
this older ad from Benson and Hedges. Smokers are literally wrapped around the Statue of Liberty. Not so subtle message. This is a question of freedom. Don't interfere with my freedom. And a German version of that. Immer frei, right? Uh, always free. And then I've also heard lectures from media experts and advertising experts that because the tobacco industry can't say that they're offering something that's going to make you healthy, what they do instead is offer you through these ads the picture of health. The picture of health. Beautiful beach, wonderful sunshine, these palm trees, two, two little people there you can barely see, no, no cigarettes anywhere in sight, but it's beautiful. It's a picture of health. And this is the way they send the message day in, day out, year in, year out, decade in and decade out, a lot of attention to advertising. So if we do public health right, uh, we have to realize they are trying to normalize and glamorize use, and we have to counter that. And there have been some great examples of how to counter that that I'm going to be showing you through this talk. So as I enter the Obama administration, I had the incredible privilege of making this a high priority for me as the Assistant Secretary for Health. By the way, everything in D.C. is an acronym. So at HHS, Health and Human Services, I was called the ASH, the Assistant Secretary for Health. And for, the, for one to be involved in tobacco control, to be called the ASH was a little ironic, if I can say. So what happened during my time there? Well, first and foremost, the Family Smoking Prevention Tobacco Control Act was signed into law. And what did that do? It granted the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, to regulate tobacco for the first time in U.S. history. So if you stop and think about it, for years we'd say in the U.S., I would say to my students, the D in FDA stands for drug. Here we have nicotine, one of the most addictive drugs out there. The FDA didn't regulate it until June 22, 2009. And what this act also did was ban flavors in cigarettes, except for menthol. Again, more on menthol later. And by the regulation, FDA could now oversee reduction of nicotine levels in cigarettes, but not to zero. And this whole historic effort happened uh, on June 22, 2009, signed by President Obama in the Rose Garden. And to have finally some regulatory authority over the tobacco industry was something that I knew was historic. Speaking about history, in 2014, uh, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the landmark Surgeon General's report. The Surgeon General, acting Surgeon General then was Boris Lushniak, who, who's a wonderful tobacco control leader. And so during my time there, this was an issue that was very high priority for me. We had a, uh, the first ever HHS strategic pl plan on tobacco control, leveraging the new authority of the FDA, having CDC and FDA and NIH all work together. Uh, it was just an, an astonishing time. So that's the national perspective. But if you look globally, what has the world done to try to practice tobacco control with the best evidence possible? Many of you are very familiar with the debates going on with the WHO. Um, how can the WHO be more empowered uh, to be as effective as possible in collaboration through this COVID-19 pandemic? Very important discussions. But if you look at the history of WHO action, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is in some ways the premier example of how countries and states can work together to uh, try to tackle a public health issue, in this case, tobacco. So uh, they developed a so-called Empower framework, adopted in 2003. Over 180 states have now signed on. Uh, the Empower stands for Monitoring Tobacco Use and Prevention. If you're serious about this as a nation, you should be tracking the appropriate data, protecting people from tobacco smoke, because it's not just direct use, but secondhand smoke in public places can be a challenge. O, offering help to quit tobacco use. And so one thing to note is that if you talk to people who smoke, the vast majority of them do not want to continue. They, they know that they're hooked and they want to stop. Cessation can help some of them, but certainly not all of them. And so they're looking for help and can we give them the best interventions possible with counseling and nicotine replacement therapy and quit lines and things like that. We can warn about the dangers of tobacco. This is where the counter-advertising is important. De-glamorizing and de-normalizing use. 
enforcing bans on advertising and then raising taxes on tobacco. This is how I got involved. And can we do this more nationally? So let me just quickly run through these where we are monitoring tobacco use and prevention policies. The, the good news is over time, since the framework convention tobacco control was started, we have um, now some 145 countries and more tracking outcomes and data and, and trying to see what trends are for the use of tobacco in some, over some 5 billion people around the world. So that's steady progress. In terms of protecting people from tobacco smoke, we now understand that having clean air in places like this should be the norm for health. And uh, if, if we had come here, you know, a generation or two generations ago, maybe many people in an audience like this would be smoking, but we should claim the norm back from the tobacco industry and have clean air be the norm. So I'll never forget when 2004, Ireland, of all places, became the first nation to have all smoke-free indoor public places. So that means in workplaces, in restaurants, and pubs, and pubs, and pubs. <laughs> the first time I heard it, I couldn't believe it. I said, what? You can't walk into a pub and not see cigarette smoke. And then I thought, wait a minute. That's the tobacco industry, again, changing the norm, saying, oh, that should be just perfectly part of the norm. So Ireland took that global lead in 2004. My colleagues and I wrote this little piece in the New England Journal called Making Smoking History Worldwide. And, you know, at first we said it seemed impossible at first. That was the first line. But it was possible in 2004. So since then, it's been fascinating to track how many other nations have made all smoke-free indoor public places uh, throughout the whole country. Some 18 years later, over a, almost 2 billion people in some 67 countries were legislation at a best practice level. All of South America now has smoke-free public places, and Canada, for example, Australia, but and I'm going to keep talking about Australia because they've been an incredible leader. So that's incredible progress in 18 years. And again, it changes the norm back. In public places, smoking is not permitted, okay? And then the O, offer help to quit tobacco use. This means can you have national quit lines, coverage for nicotine replacement therapy, oral therapy, other cessation services, you know, the vast majority of U.S. cigarette smokers want to quit. They want help. But doing this uh, unassisted has relatively low quit attempts. If you add in medication that's FDA approved and counseling, it improves cessation uh, rates by two or three times. But we need much, much more. And then the W, warning about the dangers of tobacco. Again, the whole theme here is to change the social norm. Take it back from the tobacco industry. De-glamorize and de-normalize use. So here's an ad. I smoke for taste. But the California Tobacco Control Program, that's it's been very aggressive and out front for decades, had an ad running in their state, Bob, I've got emphysema. Okay? Just change the norm back and reflect what the reality is, which the tobacco industry would like you to overlook. And so when I was there, uh, I was very proud that about 10 years ago, the, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, started putting out 30-second ads from former smokers. It's called the Tips from Former Smokers campaign. It features real live people with people who are very courageous about going public with their level of suffering so these are, have been running for 10 years and counting. Uh, by the way, when you have the privilege of being a state health commissioner or an assistant secretary, you have many meetings with media outlets who are running tentative ads past you and asking for your reactions uh, as a health professional. We have focus group testing, lots of conversations about strategy and how explicit to be, those sorts of just fascinating stuff. But the really important theme is that for each of these, you, you have to evaluate it because there's always going to be somebody who says, I don't like that ad. Take that one off. That's a waste of taxpayer money. So when, when you do these campaigns on a national level, you, you have to have the evaluation back up. These tips from former smokers campaigns have been very well evaluated. When these ads run, the calls to the quit lines go up. People report quit attempts going up. It's been published in Lancet and other very prestigious journals. So uh, in my view, and by the way, just a couple of weeks ago in New England Journal, Bob Bazell, 
Dr. Barry Bloom and I co-wrote something saying some of these strategies from tobacco maybe could be used for vaccination now. Make vaccination the norm, just like non-smoking should be the norm. Is that one broad strategy where one area of public health can inform another? And then back to the warning theme, you know that over time, people in public health have gotten very restless saying those, those little warnings, typed warnings on the side that no one can read aren't particularly effective. Shouldn't they be more graphic, more realistic, with pictures covering large parts of both the front and back of the pack? In 2012, I'll never forget being in a press conference with uh, the secretary and the FDA commissioner, Peggy Hamburg, where the U.S. proposed to have graphic warning labels on U.S. cigarettes. And guess what? We got sued by the tobacco industry. Nothing happened. So in the U.S., we still do not have graphic warning labels. But here in the EU, you do. In 2021, there are graphic warning labels in place for almost 5 billion people in some 101 countries. So follow that. That's moving forward. And then um, the E in the empower is to enforce bans on tobacco advertising. And you can have uh, bans on TV or radio or print or all the above. The U.S. has uh, a pretty good record, but not as robust as as other countries. But again, I said to you that the industry is always trying to send their message, whether it's explicit or implicit, overt or covert. If you're leaders in Australia, you say, "Okay, we're tired of cigarettes like Marlboro, the leading brand in the world, with the, the chevron that everybody understands in the, in the red and the white. You don't think too much about it, but maybe you should just strip a typical cigarette pack, which is basically advertising in front of you, take it all away and replace it with other graphic images to reduce the appeal of tobacco products. So they insisted on what's called plain packaging of cigarettes in Australia. It, it led to about a decade-long struggle in courts and the World Trade Organization, but finally in 2020, the WTO upheld plain packaging. So if you buy a pack of cigarettes in Australia or now 15 other countries, it strips away any hint of attraction and it shows the reality of what this does to human health. So now uh, you have plain packaging in in France and Saudi Arabia and Turkey, UK and Uruguay. By the way, Uruguay, I think there are a couple of members of the Uruguay community here, they, they've been a wonderful uh, leader in tobacco control. Their former president, Dr. Tabara Vasquez, was a physician oncologist. Uh, he helped make the country smoke-free, one of the f- first after Ireland did in 2004. So he, he was a giant in global public health, and um, I'm delighted to on- honor his memory in front of all of you uh, tonight. And then the R was to raise taxes on tobacco. That's the experience uh, I lived through in my state. And the share of tobacco retail price that is taxed is particularly high in parts of uh, South America and parts of Europe. And then, again, Australia and New Zealand, by the way, is another great global leader on this whole issue. So if you put all this together from Empower, after almost 20 years of work, what do you see? Well, you see a mixed picture, which is a good segue to the last part of this presentation, which gets very complicated if you take a step back, quite fascinating. And that is, on one hand, cigarette consumption is going down per capita. So for the U.S., you know, starting from 1900, it went up. Now per capita consumption is uh, going down. It's the same trend for Germany, for Japan. So it's all around the world. So in terms of public health progress, that's good news. But if you're the tobacco industry, you get a little concerned because total sales is going down. For the time being, they've been able to keep up their profits and their uh, market value is somewhere between 700, 800 billion, maybe more. They're especially increasing their market share in places like Asia. Again, it's home for me as a Korean American. By the way, the last time I was in Korea was 2007, where they asked me to come and speak for a new nicotine research organization being launched to celebrate that male smoking in Korea had dropped below 50% for the first time. 50%. I'll, I'll just never forget that. So if you're the tobacco industry and you've relied on these strategies to make 
so much profit over so long, you say, okay, these trends are starting to disturb me as a business person, what do I do? Well, one thing is you can keep doing outreach to the groups uh, who are your best customers, people of low socioeconomic status. I am the head of a relatively new health and homelessness initiative at our school, and the homeless have astronomic rates of, of tobacco use. One study in Boston showed it, it could be about 70% prevalence. Also, people with mental illness and substance use disorders, some estimates in the U.S. are some 40% of U.S. cigarettes are being consumed by people with mental illness or substance use. Uh, communities of color, the African-American community has been targeted by the tobacco industry with menthol cigarettes that, that for reasons I'm never sure I quite understand, is very popular for, for black Americans. There are higher rates in L LGBT groups and in some parts of the military. So one strategy is to keep your outreach going in terms of business uh, with such groups. But another strategy, which gets me to the uh, last part of the talk, and one that's absolutely fascinating and quite controversial now, is looking at so-called non-combustible tobacco products and seeing if they might have a role in what's called harm reduction. So if you've not heard about all this, let me, let me just try to make it as clear as possible. First of all, to remind you, cigarettes are combustible tobacco products. You light it on fire, the tobacco burns, and it releases all these chemicals and products, including tar. But you can have unheated, non-combustible tobacco products that aren't burned. It could be gums, lozenges, snuff, chewing tobacco. Okay, you don't burn those. Or you can have ones that are heated but not burned. It's a very big difference because some would say if you use e-cigarettes or electronic nicotine delivery devices, uh, you heat a product that has nicotine in it, but you have much lower levels of toxic chemicals. It's been said that people smoke from the nicotine but die from the tar, and the people who are really promoting e-cigarettes as harm reduction say, okay, well, that sounds very attractive. If people find it impossible to quit, why don't you at least reduce the harm and, and give them e-cigarettes? So I'm going to have more on that in a second. Not to confuse this, but there is a heat not burn tobacco product by Philip Morris called IQOS, I-Q-O-S. That's getting a lot of attention lately, and I'll be saying more about that in just a second. So let's just say something about harm reduction, because it's a fascinating public health concept that is now being applied potentially to tobacco and gaining a lot of headlines. And if you don't know about this concept, the whole concept is if people are engaging in behaviors that could involve some risk, how do you protect them, protect their health as much as possible while they're engaging in those behaviors? So instead of saying, okay, you have two choices, completely stop what you're doing or, or not, say, well, you can keep engaging in these behaviors but use this harm reduction intervention. So there are lots of examples here. Sunscreens. You all know that if you have too much sun exposure, you get sunburn. Sunscreens could help you continue to be out in the sun with, without having too much sun damage and risking a uh, higher chance of melanoma. Seat belts. When you're driving, that has some risk. Or uh, riding bikes. If you put on your seat belt or a bike helmet, that's harm reduction. You can keep engaging the behavior and protect your health as much as possible. And then getting more extreme, if you have an opioid addiction, you can get methadone as part of medical harm reduction. That usually occurs in highly regulated clinical settings. Or you can have syringe exchange so that people are using drugs, but at least protecting themselves from infectious diseases like hepatitis or HIV. So if you talk about harm reduction in public health that is an area that's pretty well received, although still quite controversial, when, when you, especially talking about some of these issues on methadone and syringe exchanges in public settings. It does invite public discussion. But now we are front and center in the tobacco world about e-cigarettes. Can e-cigarettes be used as a form of harm reduction for people who just cannot stop smoking? Again, this famous quote from Michael Russell in 1976, People smoke for the nicotine by die from the tar. Can we decouple those two? And it appears that exposure to potentially toxic substances from non-combustible e-cigarettes is a lot lower than from combustible tobacco cigarettes. Okay, So that's potentially a point in favor. 
And then a number of studies have been done. Can e-cigarettes help adult smokers as they attempt cessation? And you can argue that strengths and weaknesses of any one study, but this Cochrane review that put all the studies together concluded in summary, quote, we are moderately confident that nicotine e-cigarettes help more people to stop smoking than nicotine replacement therapy, the oral uh, NRT that's been around for a long, long time. However, we need more evidence to be confident about the effects of e-cigarettes, particularly the effects of newer types of e-cigarettes that have much better nicotine delivery than older types. So that's tantalizing, right? Wouldn't it be great if we could get millions of smokers who just cannot stop and at least switch them over to something where they're getting less exposure to potentially toxic substances? So some researchers and advocates have, have been promoting that potential idea. But the flip side is that as e-cigarettes have become more popular in the U.S., as you all well know, kids have taken this up in dramatic fashion. Cigarette use in kids has dropped dramatically, now under 5% in the U.S., so that's really stunning progress. But instead, so many kids are switching to e-cigarettes, and right now it's, it's projected in the latest studies by the CDC that some 2 million middle and high school kids are using e-cigarettes on a regular basis. So, and if you look at that study, uh, those studies about trends, they show that children and adolescents who use e-cigarettes have doubled their risk of going on to smoking cigarettes. Now, is that cause? I'm not sure if that's cause or not. That's still being debated. Some people say, well, if you're the type of kid who tends to use e-cigarettes, you're probably more likely to go on to cigarettes anyway. So it's an association, not a cause. We can debate that. Uh, what's very disturbing is that if you're a high school student using e-cigarettes, the vast majority are using flavored e-cigarettes. So one obvious thought is, why don't we get rid of flavored e-cigarettes? Because it's uh, bringing all these kids into use. Uh, complicating this is that flavored e-cigarettes do help some adults. So what do you do, you do about that? Uh, here's another uh, factoid that's very disturbing, is that some 43% of e-cigarette users as kids say they're using it because I'm feeling, quote, anxious, stressed, or depressed. Lots of issues about the mental health of adolescents in our country right now. And if they turn to e-cigarettes for some uh, relief, it's, it's just making all these issues more difficult. And kids understand that they are getting hooked because nicotine is addictive. And so two-thirds of them who are currently using are seriously considering quitting the use of all products. A plethora of flavored e-cigarettes on the market. And until now virtually unregulated by the Food and Drug Administration. They were not given that authority in 2009, and so now they have to play catch-up, and everyone's waiting to see what they're going to do. So if you're concerned about the harm of e-cigarettes, they're highly addictive, they're linked to some negative outcomes with respect to cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, risks to adolescent brain development up to age 25. In 2020, the world was engulfed in this terrible story about e-cigarette or vaping use associated lung injury, Uvali, that caused almost 3,000 hospitalizations and in, in mostly kids and, and 68 deaths. Now that it's quieted down, it appears that was due to many of them vaping marijuana and not just uh, nicotine uh, and having a contamination with something called uh, vitamin E acetate. For adults, a lot, lot of them start in with e-cigarettes to try to quit and then they, they're now using both combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes, what's called dual use, and the long-term health effects are unknown. That's the situation right now in the U.S. Lots of debate about whether e-cigarettes can be a form of harm reduction. Lots of questions about how it could be potentially useful for adult smokers while trying to protect kids who are taking this up in dramatic fashion. And meanwhile, the advertising is back big time. And the themes are almost what we saw decades ago, you know, take back your freedom, rise from the ashes, appealing to, to young people, glamorizing this. A big question for the Food and Drug Administration now under a new commissioner, how is the U.S. going to regulate this, especially since advertising is pretty much allowed for, for e-cigarettes except for some few, a few federal prohibitions? Should we ban flavored e-cigarettes to protect kids? And then how does the Food and Drug Administration now meet the so-called standard of appropriate for the protection of public health, helping adults smokers quit while not endangering youth. So to make this 
really uh, very, very complicated in the last couple of years. The FDA now has authorized a couple non-combustible products, the ICOS product from Philip Morris, and then uh, last fall, the e-cigarette uh, Vus Solo, uh, they determined after their considerations that these were potentially appropriate for the protection of public health. Uh, lots of criticism from the advocates. No e-cigarette has currently been approved by the FDA as a cessation device, so that's, that's clear, but lots of discussion about whether it could or not. And then in the meantime, if you look at the biggest companies with the biggest market share of e-cigarettes in the U.S., Juul, Voos, uh, Phantom Ventures, that's 75% of the e-cigarette market, they are either partially or completely owned by the tobacco industry. The impact of independent e-cigarette companies is relatively low. So in short, big tobacco has become big nicotine. So what's the tobacco industry done with all this? Well, they see an opportunity. The explicit statement from Altria, the U.S. Uh, Philip Morris company, that they are moving beyond smoking. They're moving from a tobacco company to a tobacco harm reduction company. Well, that sounds wonderful, right? I mean, they want to reduce harm, but the irony, of course, is they're they want to reduce harm for the people that, in whom they've created the harm in the first place. They're still selling combustible cigarettes while they're trying to sell these new products in a way to keep their business going. They have new types of ads, unsmoke your party. They want a smoke-free future, they say. With ICOS, they're trying to associate this with cafes and drinking coffee. It's all back to normalizing these products once again. It's, it's literally back to the future. And then as I close, here, here's something that I just learned in the last 6 to 12 months, which I find very, very disturbing, and that is the major media newspapers in our country, which all banned tobacco advertising years ago, are starting to take tobacco advertising again in what's called paid advertorial. So let me be very explicit about my hometown newspaper, the Boston Globe, a, a newspaper I respect, has always been excellent on public health, in 1999, when I was commissioner, they announced that they are, for public health reasons, that we're not going to take tobacco advertising money anymore. We all thought that was great. And then it turns out that in the last couple of years, they are accepting paid advertising. They pay to have these essays about open and transparent science leading to progress, who can be held responsible for stopping misinformation. I mean, that theme is all over the place with the pandemic, right? And if you look in tiny letters in the red box, it says paid for by Philip Morris International, all right? Sometimes they honor these scientists who they feel are really excellent at advancing open and transparent science, and they're featured in these, but they don't realize that it's paid for by the tobacco industry. So when this article came out in Commonwealth Magazine, and I was quoted in it, I mean, scientist after scientist said, why did the tobacco industry do this? I had no idea that they were, they were featuring me in this, uh, these advertorials. Please take my name out. So... They keep going in 2022. It remains a fascinating, a very uh, dynamic times. Can we start thinking, as we do all the work uh, with the Framework Convention, uh, using the Empower Framework, trying to decide whether e-cigarettes can be a form of harm reduction, holding the industry accountable for claiming they promote harm reduction when, in fact, they still make combustible cigarettes by the billions, is that can we think about new, bold, and fundamentally different uh, strategy. So one is requiring the tobacco industry to reduce nicotine content in their cigarettes to non-addictive levels. I mean, that's a fascinating concept, one that I personally was involved in lots of internal meetings at Health and Human Services about whether the FDA would move into that direction. In 2017, uh, then, the then commissioner made an announcement that he and the agency was going to move into this strategy, got a lot of attention, but then he left. Uh, no action taken since then. So we're, we're seeing what's going to happen under a new uh, FDA commission, where they're going to revive that effort. There are some efforts in countries around the world, the U.S. and elsewhere, to have what's called a tobacco-free generation. So just prohibit sales of tobacco products to all individuals born in or after a specific year. So in Brookline, Massachusetts, in my home state, it was first proposed that if you're born after January 1, 2000, uh, you will never be allowed to buy cigarettes. We want a tobacco-free generation. This is getting more attention around the world. I understand Denmark is considering something like this. How about just having what's called Project Sunset, where you abolish tobacco product sales, 
The Kingdom of Bhutan attempted this starting in 2010, so that was the first nation in my understanding that just said tobacco is not part of our society or culture. But they had to end this 10 years later because apparently it was very hard to enforce. In 2014, when I was Assistant Secretary of CVS Health, one of the biggest pharmacy chains in our country, claimed that you would stop selling tobacco. They said, we're a pharmacy, we're a health group. We don't think this is part of our mission. So that got tremendous attention. And their, their sales has, have done very well without selling tobacco or e-cigarettes. So we're waiting to see what Rite Aid and Walgreens will do. They, they haven't followed up, which has been disappointing to me personally, but hopefully they, they will. And then if you look at places like New Zealand, they've had an excellent public health profile in many ways in COVID and others. They have had explicit discussion about all these strategies as part of a nationwide plan to drop tobacco prevalence under 5% by 2025. And then the final point is, is it time to now be explicit about talking about tobacco as a human rights issue? Of course, when I mention this, I have to mention my brother, Harold Coe, who's a, another friend of the American Academy in Berlin, a world-renowned international human rights lawyer. He and I have talked together about this issue in forums like this, and he will opine that uh, this is an industry that has claimed rights all along the way, the right to commercial speech, the uh, rights for intellectual property. Shouldn't this be so high on the human rights agenda as a uh, issue that's going to kill one billion people in the 21st century? So as I end, I hope that when you see this quote, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health as one of the fundamental rights of every human being, first that you ponder about what the highest attainable standard means. Think about how you can contribute to that discussion as a public health colleague. All of you here, regardless of your background, are public health colleagues. And then if we're going to be serious about this and make an impact, we've got to start with the big things that are killing people right now, pandemics like COVID and then the forever pandemic of tobacco. Thank you very, very much. The fight against tobacco was enormously successful for, shall we say, the middle, upper, middle, upper classes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned yep. targeting disadvantaged uh, populations, and you mentioned the homeless. Right. And so the question I have is, has the effort to reduce tobacco consumption in the developed world lost some of its urgency because the policy class and the people who are most politically literate mm -hmm. uh, and engaged feel like it's been achieved. Yeah, and it's absolutely right. You're absolutely right. If you are of higher socioeconomic position in any society, the tobacco issue has um, shown dramatic progress but it's now concentrated much more on people of low income, low educational uh, attainment, and then these uh, other targeted groups. And there's so many public health areas where you, you see exactly the same trend. You see more affluent people benefiting from public health. You see the uh, less affluent bearing the greatest burden. You see communities of color bearing a lot of the burden, which is where all the health, health equity discussions are. And then the other thing is that we've been successful at getting this off of TV and in public places in so many countries that people just don't see it anymore. And so it's, it's still being used, but you, you don't see it. So you have now gotten to the nub of the issue that has continued to frustrate me, quite honestly, is that, I mean, why aren't we hearing about tobacco dependence as a forever pandemic every day in the news? I mean, look at these numbers. This has been going on for over a century. Look at all the preventable deaths. Where is the media? Where is the press? Where is the outrage? But the flip side is, this is a chronic situation. It's, it's not acute like COVID. And then the other thing is the tobacco industry has done a wonderful job saying, okay, well, you see somebody smoking down the street. Well, that's normal. Every, you know, everybody does that. It's been going on for decades. So why is that a big deal? And then they, then they complicate it with their harm reduction uh, strategies, as I've just uh, said. We've made progress, but we've got a long way to go. It looks to me very impressive on the progress in terms of smoking, even if it's socially divided in a certain yep. way. Mm -hmm. But looking at this, have there been any observation as new dependencies on smoking have developed less? Are there other dependencies like alcohol or so that have compensated for it, looking at the psychological impact that 
people would like to get out of it. And on the other side, with the remaining smokers, what's been the most successful strategies of getting people off the cigarette? And so if you look at the issue of substance use disorders more broadly, it's a very challenging area because for tobacco alone, you have both combustible and non-combustible products. And then if you look big picture on substance use, you have, you have opioids and you have marijuana and you have, of course, alcohol. During pandemic, all these issues got worse. The ability of human beings to be vulnerable to substances is something that, that is very, very humbling. And we just have to try to understand it better. And then very importantly, try to offer people services because too often there's a stigma and we don't have the workforce. And then we have the overlap between substance use, tobacco use, and, and mental illness. It gets even more complicated. So we need the best mental health professionals to be involved in this too. A lot of what you were showing reminds me of some of the struggles we have faced fighting the oil industry. Mm -hmm. And which leads me to ask, first, do you see any lessons from your experience that could be applied for other industries that are creating public health problems? And related to that, do you see any scope for perhaps collaboration, allyship between the fight against tobacco and, for example, the fight for clean air, um, the fight against pollution, mm -hmm. understanding that air pollution is also a major cause of lung cancers and other negative health outcomes. So sadly, we see these themes over and over again. When there's an industry and business dimension, and by the way, I've written about how important it is for private business and public health to work together and have been criticized for it. So I, I am not anti-business. I, I think some of the best public health professionals I've met have been people in private business who really take this on. But unfortunately, when you have the exemplar of the tobacco industry, and then unfortunately with fossil fuel industry, as the science becomes more and more apparent, you know, the first reaction is always, oh, you know, science is faulty, and this is flawed, and the goal is to just float doubt all the time until it just is overwhelming and people have to realize that you can't argue that way. So for climate change, if I can say, I, th I think scientifically we're at that point, but, but then the question is, are you going to act on it? Can you learn? For, for tobacco, I've just reviewed the history. I mean, for years, the tobacco industry said, you know, you know that famous congressional hearing, I, I do not believe nicotine is addictive. I mean, that wasn't that long ago, right? At least they don't say that anymore. But now they're saying we're, we're a harm reduction company. We're, we're the good guys putting ad, out ads that way. So I think we just have to be aware of these trends that we see over and over in public health history and try to call attention to the, to the tactics of the industry when they need to be called out. Howard Coe was speaking at the American Academy in Berlin. Thanks to them for providing this recording. I'm Paul Barclay. Thanks for listening. Bye. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.